buildings. We all live in them and we all work in them. So it's no wonder that they're a major source of global greenhouse gas emissions. But they don't have to be. Today we meet the innovators who hold the keys to a clean building sector. Join us as we uncover unexpected pockets of green, even here in London's concrete jungle. Going forward, we must lay the foundation for a sustainable urban landscape, no matter how tall or small the building. In this episode of Sustainable Energy, we meet companies working on innovations and technologies to revolutionise energy efficiency, cut costs and carbon emissions, and build a home for a clean energy future. Ahead in the programme. We sing from the same song sheet with a green opera house designer. Then we step into human-centric buildings before we shine a light on a carbon cutting curtain. To help us on our journey, I met with Professor Derek Clements Croom, Emeritus Professor at the University of Reading in the UK, to get his perspective on intelligent buildings and the latest developments in the construction industry. But first, let's take a look at some facts and figures. In 2018, the building sector represented 28% of global carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions, two-thirds from rapidly growing electricity use. The rate of electricity demand in buildings has increased five times faster than improvements in the carbon intensity of the power sector since the year 2000. It's expected though that the building sector will see a CO2 reduction of an average of 6% per year to one eighth of current levels by 2050. It's estimated that decisive action by governments to support a sustainable building sector would save around 4.8 trillion US dollars globally over the next 30 years. In a skyline of soaring skyscrapers, sustainability could be left at the bottom of the pile. In Dubai, there's a company ensuring it stays centre stage. Dubai is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. It's home to over 150 skyscrapers, including the world's tallest hotel and the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, measuring 828 metres high. But amongst the tall is the smart. Under Dubai's clean energy strategy, the country has set out to produce 75% of its energy requirements from clean sources by 2050. By gradually increasing the employment of clean energy sources and meeting this target, Dubai will become the city with the smallest carbon footprint in the world. A vital building block of this green future is sustainable buildings and Atkins, a global design, engineering and project management consultancy, have this at the top of their agenda. What's very current for us at the moment is uh, our policy and transformation within our policy. We are looking to align ourselves with the UN Sustainability Development Goals, uh, which I think is critical for the building industry to focus on at the moment. Atkins made its mark on the city's skyline with the iconic Dubai Opera, which was completed in August 2016 in accordance with the Dubai Municipality Green Building Code. There's a lot of uh, key features. I think the two that stand out to me, one is a, a passive uh, feature, which is based on the, uh, the concept of the building, which is based around a, uh, a Dao uh, boat, which is a traditional sailing boat in the region which has a, a, a restricted base and a, and a broad crown, which allows the building to cast a shadow on itself at peak periods in the day in order to manage and mitigate uh, solar radiation. Um, I think the other feature that really stands out for me is, is the active one, which is obviously a flexible design, uh, a flexible build, uh, building that can accommodate to several different types of venues and modes, which means that uh, the building itself is being intensely used uh, and avoids the need to build a separate venue for different types of concerts. One of the most unique aspects of the building is that it can convert into three modes, from a theatre, into a concert hall and into a flat four form, offering 2,000 square metres of space for events such as exhibition and gala events. The facade of the building is actually quite, quite complex. Um, the building has a 360 uh, degree lobby right the way around the base of the building with a 30 meter high atrium running right the way up the building. Uh, and the facade itself is made up of over 1200 glass panels. 
And these glass panels have anti-reflective coating internally and externally in order to mitigate the solar radiation. Bolted onto the facade, we have, uh, I think it's in the region of five linear kilometers of louvers creating shade on the building to manage the cooling loads. Uh, and all of that enables the building to act as a quite a, 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 a transparent and inviting structure. It remains to be seen if it's feasible that such a bold built environment can indeed become the city with the smallest carbon footprint in the world by 2050. Derek Clements Groom is an emeritus professor at the University of Reading and visiting professor at Queen Mary University London. His current research, teaching and writing is focused on attaining and managing healthy and sustainable well-being environments in buildings of all types. Derek is also editor and founder of the Intelligent Buildings International Journal. Well, Derek, first of all, thank you so much for your time and joining us for this episode of Sustainable Energy. Maybe we could start with something quite general. Can you tell us exactly what is an intelligent building? An intelligent building is one that meets the needs of people, so that it should provide environments where uh, you have good health and well well-being, because in those environments people are more productive, they're happier, and so on. And they should also be sustainable. And that's a very important issue today, of course, because architecture has quite an impact on, on climate change. Um, then there's the technology underneath this. It's a kind of foundation, um, but it's a servant, not a master. You can't solve everything with technology. What are the most urgent areas of improvement in terms of making the building sector more sustainable in general? Well, there are four principal areas. Uh, there's energy, uh, there's uh, waste, uh, there's water and pollution. The difficulty with buildings and architecture generally is that it's designed by lots of people. There are many actors in the process and the construction and the management of these buildings and getting everyone to work together is important. So we need to have integrated design and planning teams uh, that agreed the mission very seriously that uh, sustainability is a number one priority. Tell us about some of the savings that can be achieved through intelligent buildings. Well, intelligent buildings that are well designed will have substantial savings in water consumption, uh, energy, uh, and smart uh, waste systems, for example, to reuse waste, uh, and also will be less polluting. All of those things are very important. But it's difficult to give precise figures about savings. They will vary a lot depending on the context. But what we do know with more certainty is that the benefits of designing intelligent buildings, uh, as opposed to just taking the cost figure, so the benefit to cost ratio is very significant. It's probably a minimum of like two to one. So it's the benefits and the values that far outstrip the initial costs. Well, it's fascinating talking to you, Derek. Thank you so much. We'll have lots more coming up from Derek later on in the show. After the break, we open the doors of a building which puts people first. It's been said that empathy makes good business sense, but that's not often a quality associated with buildings. In Finland, it's an essential building block for sustainable office spaces. Tieto works in and with the energy sector to develop and implement sustainable building solutions. It uses digitization and smart technology in offices to make buildings more environmentally friendly, but also crucially to boost employee well-being, productivity and innovation. The standard features of our headquarters is the infrastructure in efficiency in the building itself. But I think the real uh, interesting part is actually the digital uh, space that we are build, have built uh, on top of the infrastructure. And that means that we can now uh, monitor uh, the well-being of the people, uh, see the people flows and the utilizations of different floors. Its products are based on empathy in attempting to make so-called empathic buildings that understand the people who work in them. It uses a solution that combines sensor technology, internet solutions and data-driven analytics. 
all the disparate building systems, for instance, heating, cooling, lighting and emissions impacts are centrally managed as a holistic whole. The biggest issues when we are trying to make buildings more sustainable is the current infrastructure, the current hardware that is uh, installed in these buildings. Because they have been implemented throughout several decades, so the systems usually don't actually already communicate with each other. So the first step, of course, is now how do you make everything uh, speak together of these different systems. Now we are talking about heating, cooling, lighting, uh, ventilation. All of these systems need to be now talking together and in an old building, uh, that is a key issue that is, needs to be addressed. There's a myriad of heat and ventilation settings, hundreds of LED lamps and thousands of occupancy sensors monitoring the environment every day and feeding back information to the owners, operators and users of the building. All of this keeps energy consumption as efficient as possible, as well as lowering emissions and energy bills all at the same time. Our data centres in the Nordics operate on green energy. And for instance, here in the city of Espo, we collaborate with our customer, the energy company, to use the excess heat from the data centers to warm the nearby houses. So by doing this, we actually warm around 1,000 homes here in Espo. The benefits of Tieto's technology for the environment are clear, but is it too far-fetched to claim that bricks and mortar can make people happier and more productive? The tangible benefits come through the easiness. Uh, people are able to save time. They can book rooms, find their colleagues on the go. They don't need to do search and reservations in advance. When we introduced this system, we also realized that it's, it must be fun for people to use the data in this way. And therefore, we could see a peak in the utilization rate. People are more present, I mean, for us, it's OK to do remote work, but people wanted to come to office to see their colleagues, to work physically together. Time will tell, though, if there's room for this technology on a major scale or if it will remain a niche novelty. The sustainable building itself uh, needs to be managed not as a building by itself, but as a fleet of buildings making up the entire city. It is a totally different thing when you're controlling one building, but if you have energy management, for example, for 100 buildings in a city, then you will have a system level effect in the entire city, maybe even the entire country. So how realistic is it actually to have a building that is human-centric, that can actually improve the well-being of the people inside? Well, it absolutely is. We actually... Um, are sensory beings. We live through our senses. Uh, the look and feel of the place, the colours, the air, uh, the views out of the windows, all of these things have an effect on our emotions, uh, our physical being, our general positive outlook in, in the daily life that, that we lead. And nowadays there are even rating systems which are able to assess and monitor uh, the health and well-being of people in their workspace. A lot of the technology in these intelligent buildings seems to rely on gathering personal data. What's the balance between privacy and danger in that area? Yes, this is uh, an issue. Uh, and I think it depends a lot in developing a trust between the employer and the employees. Uh, because there are some companies already giving Fitbits and various wearable technology out to their employees. And in Sweden, there are even some companies that are embedding these devices into the body, into the hand, for example. Um, but I think the message should be, first of all, you, cannot, you don't have to share any data. You have the option of just being personal data. Or you have the next level is to selectively share data. For example, your medical data, you might want to share with your doctor, for example, but no one else. And then the third one is there is environmental data, like if you're measuring on your lapel the air pollution. Well, most people want to contribute to that. So that's an example of data which everyone is usually happy to share because it's benefiting everyone else as well. What needs to happen in order to make sustainable buildings the norm rather than the exception? Education. And the education I'm talking about is starting from childhood. And we are now witnessing, of course, this great um, 
recognition of this by young children inspired by Greta Thunberg. Uh, and the young people want the earth, they treasure the earth. We should actually look at inspiring examples. And I think the David Attenborough programs on, on television have inspired everyone that the media could use those kind of approaches that involve uh, people do treasure nature. Uh, and so I think those are the main issues we should. There are also the United Nations have set about 17 goals we should be looking for. And again, another logo for the setting that. This means companies and businesses need to, at the border level, have somebody whose duty it is to look at sustainability as part of the constitution for their companies. Very important. Thanks, Derek. Now, it may be that you think you know everything there is to know about intelligent buildings, but here's one common misconception. You thought you knew? Think again. Myth. The benefits of sustainable buildings are not worth the money they cost to build. Fact. New technology comes at a price, but once installed, the high levels of energy efficiency and savings in water and gas make for more cost-effective buildings in the long term. LEED certified buildings have recorded a significant reduction in day-to-day -day costs year over year. Maintenance costs are thought to be 20% less than conventional commercial buildings. Green building retrofits typically decrease operation costs by almost 10% in just one year, which demonstrates the updating of old or existing buildings is worthwhile in terms of reducing that construction's carbon footprint. After the break, we draw the curtain back on an inventive carbon cutting solution. Photosynthesis is normally associated with plants, but in London, some buildings are branching out to act like trees. Ecologic Studio, an architectural and urban design firm in London, has invented an algae biocurtain which converts CO2 from polluted inner city air into clean oxygen. So this is uh, one of our bioplastic uh, prototypes, uh, which creates a, a thin membrane uh, with uh, artificial habitat for the cultures to grow. Um, the sun shines through the curtain and activates the photosynthesis. Uh, the design of this cavity is such that we can uh, inoculate uh, uh, or introduce dirty air from the bottom, that the air, na air naturally rises through and comes into contact with the molecules of the algae, which cleans it. And then clean air and oxygen is released from the top back into the atmosphere. It was commissioned by Climate KIC, the EU's Climate Innovation Initiative, and it was unveiled at the Climate Innovation Summit held in Dublin in 2018. Our design agenda is aimed at integrating biotechnology inside of the design process in a seamless manner. So that is not about designing the building and adding technology, but the building itself become a living organism, able to interact with change and instill positive dynamic in the planet. The so-called urban curtain is made of modules containing algae, which have been treated in a lab to enhance their natural ability to turn carbon dioxide into oxygen. Well, at this stage of the development of the project, uh, we offer around 20% more value compared to vertical garden systems that you find on the market uh, at the moment. This is because the system is uh, very resilient due to the resiliency of the algae, but also of the software elements that uh, comes with it. And at the same time, uh, it requires a lot less maintenance uh, as we are able to monitor and control the growth of the cultures uh, in real time. Its designers say the curtain can be easily adapted to be draped onto any buildings, old or new. The feasibility of Photosynthetica relies on its ability to be applied to different scenarios. And for this reason, we haven't developed a single product, but really a technology that can be applied in different contexts. So we have a high-end ETFE-based product for new buildings, as well as a cheaper and more scalable option for buildings such as malls and warehouses that offer a lot of surface for photosynthesis and can really help the scalability of the project. 
Unlike other technological innovations, such as robotic factories and smart AI environments, these curtains show that innovation can sometimes be simple living solutions that help the environment. Microalgae are exceptional photosynthetic machines. Their ability to capture CO2 is 10 times higher than large trees. And that's because their entire body is photosynthetic. And so when we integrate it in our technology, even a thin layer has the same capacity to absorb CO2 as a microforest. This offers a renewed potential for integrating carbon capturing technologies into dense and polluted urban environments. Making the buildings act like trees means the concrete jungles of the future could be greener than we think. Now Derek, obviously we can't demolish all the old buildings in the world and start again. So how realistic and worthwhile is it to adapt and add on to existing buildings to make them more sustainable? Yeah, I mean this is very important that we, we do this because over 80% of the uh, buildings that will be present in uh, 2050 are already here now with us. Only a small number of new buildings to come. Now, when you're doing restoration and uh, retrofit, the inside of the building is easy to cope with. It's usually the shell of the building which is the most challenging uh, part. On the other hand, there is a very outstanding example of the Empire State Building in New York, was renovated a few years ago and saving tremendous amount of energy. And the cost was paid back within four years so very, very successful. When we're planning buildings for the future, what lessons can be learned from the past? Well, we can learn a lot from architecture of past ages called vernacular architecture, um, because people are very ingeniously designed dwelling places uh, in the past in regions throughout the world, very hot, very humid, very cold, wherever you are in the world, there is some indigenous architecture from which we can learn. It's what we call passive control. In other words, they looked at how they could live in caves or heavy structures when it was a very hot condition. So it's mass of the building, there's insulation of the building, all of those things. Uh, in uh, Iran and those countries, you get bagdiers, which are ventilation shafts, which uh, heat up in the day, cool at night and give you natural ventilation. And all of those very basic, simple ideas should be the hallmark, the actual foundation of designing modern buildings today. Because if you use the passive, you decrease the amount of energy you need on the active systems going into the building. How feasible are the goals of the United Nations Climate Change Conferences? And if they are achievable, how can that be done? It involves the world, all the countries coming together, and we can see that isn't easy. But we, we have to now move beyond uh, climate deniers. It's, it's a fact that our climate is being affected in serious ways. And that's going to have implications on living conditions. Bearing in mind the growing population of the world. We're about 7.5 billion now, about 11 billion by 2100. So the pressures are increasing, not decreasing. We've got to keep the awareness programme the top of the agenda and to ensure that everybody's involved because there is a tendency to think oh well it's not it doesn't involve me it's it's somebody else somebody else but we have to question almost everything we do in our lives do we really need that much water right do we really need the heating on can we put some more clothing on very simple measures really we have to question almost every things we do so lifestyle um, is important in this too. Yeah, Derek, there's lots that we can do and lots to look forward to as well. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank it's you so much for your time. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks to innovative urban designers and architects, our homes, workplaces and leisure buildings could soon be greener inside and out with low emissions and new levels of energy efficiency. The building blocks are there. Now's the time to give the green light to put them together across every urban landscape. Next time, we'll meet companies that are multitasking, hitting on revolutionary multi-energy solutions to everything from smart cities to mobility. And you can join our discussion. If you have any questions to share with us, we'll put them to our next expert. Tweet us at CNBC Energy using the hashtags AskSE and Sustainable Energy. Until next time, keep thinking green. Goodbye. Goodbye.